right, so today's Friday. Figured it would just be easier to go on and slide through a little bit more of these slides. Uh, get them in and get them out. Uh, don't forget that on Wednesday, the, what day is that? The, come on calendar. On Wednesday, the 8th, the 8th, that is presentation day. So Miranda will be doing her presentation. Uh, Mathili and uh, gosh, Nakia. Every time I just feel so bad. Kia, Kai, I'm so bad. I keep messing up your name. They will be doing their presentation and Carabo, your presentation. So schedule to meet with me so we can talk about your presentation. Wednesday's big presentation day. Uh, after that, we'll continue onward with our set uh, discussion of parties and interest groups. Yeah, so let's make a little bit more progress on how Americans vote, ballot access and firm, and continue learning more about elections, the electoral system here in America. So when we left off on Wednesday, we were talking about the Australian ballot uh, and what are the perks of having that. Let's see, the second question, uh, the rise of the Australian ballot had all of the following uh, effects except banning voters from 21 from voting, encouraging ticket splitting, helping incumbent challenge and challenges, incumbent candidates, or making the ballot longer. The answer is A banning voters from under 21 voting. Recall that all the Australian ballot does is it presents the names of all the candidates running for any given office on the same ballot, regardless of party. So you can pick and choose whoever it is that you want to vote for. So let's talk about where do we vote? We vote in districts. Uh, elected officials represent people in specific places, in specific offices. Uh, for the most part, America employs single member districts. Uh, the electorate is only allowed to vote for one representative for each district. Uh, the only exceptions to this case is when we vote for our senators, as well as the way in which the president is elected. Uh, in particular, for presidents, we use the Electoral College. And so let's see. These exceptions, as I said before, to the one person, one, one person, one vote rule. Uh, U.S. senators, uh, members of each Senate represent, well, not members of the Senate. So each state has two senators. So technically two representatives. Uh, and as I said also before, the Electoral College is also an uh, exception. Uh, let's see. Yeah. More about single member districts. Uh, single member districts tend to exaggerate the victory of the majority. Uh, back in 2010, uh, during the 2010 midterm election, uh, Republicans won about 53.5% of the national two party vote, but only, not but only, but actually won 55.6, so almost 56% of the seats in Congress that were up for grabs, particularly in the House. Meanwhile, in 2012, during that presidential election, Obama won 51% of the national vote of the popular vote, but won 62% of the college. Uh, single member districts also shrinks the power of smaller groups. Uh, single member districts also weaken third parties. Uh, if you wanna learn more information, uh, we talk about this in depth in voters and elections, talks about like the very nature of plurality the way that it works in our electoral system, it decreases the strength or the potential for any third party to have any type of representation or power. So this is why very, very rarely, yeah, you'll hear about the Green Party or the Libertarian Party or even now just a little bit of the Social Democrats. But notice, while Bernie Sanders is usually an independent, he is not running as an independent for president. This is the second time like he has shed his independent stance and is running as a Democrat. Another noteworthy of uh, what Democratic Socialist AOC is a Democrat for now.
So, of course, we know the census is happening right now. Yours truly, they sent me like two, uh, what's it called? It's two invitations to uh, fill out my census. Don't worry, it will be done. But why does all this matter? Well, because ultimately what happens after the census is that all those congressional district lines have to be redrawn. And so here's what goes on during that process. Uh, every 10 years, the census happens. They use a mathematical formula to determine the number of congressional seats to which each state is now uh, entitled. Uh, this whole process, this is known as reapportionment. Uh, that then after we do reapportionment to see how many seats each state gets within the House, our strategists, you know, look at the uh, findings, seat gains and losses, and ultimately strategists, strategists also examine, examine laws, all that stuff, election laws, court decisions, trying to figure out what is the best way to redraw these lines. Of course, the national parties get involved and other state resources to try and exert the maximum influence over the reapportionment process, as well as then, you know, they lobby state leaders to get favorable treatment. And then, of course, state legislators and legislative commissions hold hearings. Then the new districts are drawn. The bill is voted in the state legislature. Are the state legislature, state legislative officers happy with the way that the new uh, districts have been drawn? Yes. Then it's sent to the governor. The governor accepts or vetoes. Uh, losers appeal to state and federal courts who make the final decision. And then parties begin planning for next round. And then we have our new drawn, newly drawn districts for another 10 years until it's time for the census to happen all over again in 2030. And so while most states uh, uh, handle redistricting, an increasing number of states are actually uh, consulting with an outside commission or have its own separate independent commission. It's usually a bipartisan group that uh, handles the commission and draws the boundaries independently. Uh, California recently became one of the few states that uh, employs a commission to draw district boundaries. Uh, and so websites for the commission has a lot of interesting resources to show how, uh, how these politics are actually played in action. Uh, usually there's this video I show in voters and elections in particular that shows the ways in which the redistricting, the redrawing of the lines could go awry. And so what happens when this goes awry? It's known as gerrymandering. And so all gerrymandering is, is just the reapportionment of voters and districts in such a way that gives unfair, uh, unfair advantage to a political party or to a certain group or to a certain goal. Uh, gerrymandering creates less, gerrymandering is creating less of a bias as it did in previous decades. Um, one of the reasons for this is that voters are already segregated into communities of like-minded voters, but the ways that you can see how pervasive it is, is like pull up the congressional district map for Ohio. Uh, so if you look at it, whenever you get a chance on Google, I, if I remember, I can actually show this on Monday, like you pull up the map, in particular for Franklin County, there is a congressional district within the realm of Franklin County that's shaped like a four leaf clover. And that's directly in the middle that encompasses Columbus, but the rest of Franklin County are split into, I wanna say two other congressional districts. And one of those congressional districts also encompasses Delaware. So Delaware, Westerville, and I think Lewis Center and all the other uh, smaller cities or towns that are also in Delaware County. Uh, if you look at Cleveland, the Cleveland area, there's a congressional district that looks like a sliver of a salamander. I think that's Cayuga County. It's really in the, that congressional district is spread across three other counties too. And so it's, those are instances of gerrymandering in a way that see these congressional lines are being drawn that give, that uh, give special benefit or advantage to certain groups. It doesn't even have to necessarily be a party. Uh, draw, lines can be drawn to ensure uh, minority, represent, minority representation. And while for that group, it may sound, it may be interesting on face, it's like, yes, that group will always be guaranteed an elected official that represents them. But in the long run, it decreases electoral competition. Uh, and that's ultimately what voters want. You don't want to uh, be in a district where you've had the same representative for the last 30 years. 
you uh, what voters want. What voters want are elections that are competitive each and every year. You want candidates and incumbents to compete for your support at every single election. But with gerrymandering, it creates uh, districts that are safe and incumbents want districts that are safe. Voters want districts that are competitive. Elect uh, incumbents want districts that are safe. So let's talk about what it takes to win. What does it take to be number one? Because two is not a winner and three nobody remembers. It feels so good to say that fine. Like every year I say that line and every year I realize that fewer and fewer people recognize the reference. If you also don't recognize the reference it's from Nelly's number one, Nelly was a rapper. My, my Eeyore understood it. Eeyore got it. Eeyore got it. Anyways, most elections require a plurality of votes to win. What does that mean? All the plurality rule is, is just a rule in which victory goes to the individual who got the most votes in an election. May not necessarily be the majority of the votes, but got the most votes. So let's say in an election, let's say it's a mayoral election and there are four people uh, that are trying to vie for the election. So candidate A receives 30% of the vote. Meanwhile, candidates B, C, and D, they each received about 20% of the vote. Now that means candidate A won the election because candidate A has 30% of the vote. No, no, let's actually increase that up a little bit more. 40% of the vote. So that way all this equals to 100%. So candidate A has 40 Candidates B, C, and D each have about 20%. So yes, candidate A wins under the plurality rule because candidate A has 40%. However, candidate A doesn't have majority of the vote. In fact, majority of the votes were not A. So if you add B, C, and D together, that's 60%. Majority of voters did not want candidate A. However, in, under the plurality rule, candidate A wins because candidate A has most of the votes. Uh, an alternative to plurality is proportional representation, but this is not consistent with single member districts. And so what some states and some counties do for their elections is that in addition to the plurality rule, they have the majority rule where in order to declare someone the winner in elections that have more than two candidates running, you have to have at minimum 50% of the vote. And so in a case, an example, like I mentioned before, the candidates A, B, C, and D, uh, candidate A, of course, had 40%, the rest had 20 percentage. Let's say that candidate B has 30%. And then, of course, that's 40, 30, that's 70. So, of course, that last 30% point is C and D did not meet the minimum to be considered the two highest. So in that case, there would be a runoff election between candidate A and B. And under those circumstances, the way the turnout will, the way voter turnout would happen is that of course, one of these two would win the runoff election. And so it's ultimately determined during the runoff election who ultimately won the seat in question. So let's talk about how voters decide. Um, so voting is strongly correlated with demographics, electoral choices, and context. The older you are, the more likely you are to vote. The more education you have, the more likely you are to vote. The more uh, permanent, the longer you've stayed in one position or in one place, the more likely you are to vote. Uh, as I said before, we people between the ages of 18 and 30 are transient. We move around a lot, even though I've been here for eight years, still moved around. I've moved three times. I've moved to three different uh, places, districts. So, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, people vote when they are interested in the issues. We'll actually see what turnout will be, be like when it's time for uh, the Ohio primary in June. And even in my home state of Georgia, what like actually see what turnout is like in midst of the coronavirus. Uh, let's see, uh, 
One way that you can actually also increase voter turnout is decrease or weaken registration requirements. So <clears throat> voters also vote less in down ballot races because they tend to have less information or know the candidates or their positions really well. So no one is truly really interested in the uh, county coroner race or the city comptroller or the sanitation sanitation supervisor races. But if those were special elections, yeah, no one turns out for those. But if they're luckily placed during, you know, bigger ticket items, so during congressional elections or during presidential elections, they will also get decent turnout too. So let's get into how voters decide. One of the biggest, not one of the, the single strongest indicator predictor of a person's vote is party ID. You ask a person if they're a Democrat, Republican, whatever, I'm a Democrat. Nine times out of 10, that means they're going to vote Democratic down the party line. They're going to vote down that ticket. Why? It's because this partisan loyalty represents a psychological attachment it represents an ideological attachment, usually to the liberal side if they are a Democrat, a conservative side if they are a Republican. Uh, this partisan loyalty also indicates an attachment to previous experience with the party, whether that experience is, you know, I know that my parents were Democrats, my grandparents were Democrats, I grew up in a Democratic neighborhood, I, I remember going to an Obama rally, or I remember my parents telling me about the Al, like this Al Gore rally where they first met and they fell in love and got married, like all of these things. Partisan loyalty represents all of that. And majority of voters, even if they claim that they're not representative or uh, claim a party title, if they're, you know, even if they say, I don't like labels, I consider myself to be an independent, or, you know, I am a socialist, or I am a libertarian, majority of voters consistently vote for one party or another. Consistently. Consistently, even those that say I'm independent, they consistently vote for one party over another. So let's talk about what happened in 2016. How does party ID play into what happened in 2016? So, of course, red represents voted for Trump, yellow, other, blue, Clinton. And of course, we have a column for. Democrats, a column for Republicans, and then a column for independents. So we see, you know, overwhelmingly 89% of Democrats voted for Clinton. Meanwhile, for Republicans, 90% voted for Trump. And then we get a little split here, but majority of independents voted for Trump. 48%. Meanwhile, we see, you know, 2% voted for, you know, an independent person in terms for the Democratic Party uh, for uh, and only about 9% of Democrats voted for Trump. 7% uh, of Republicans voted for Clinton, 3% for others. And then, you know, 42% of independents voted for Clinton and then 10% voted for another person. But you can see regardless of whatever their moniker is, they overwhelmingly vote for one person or another. Republicans overwhelmingly vote for the Republican choice. Democrats overwhelmingly voted for the Democratic choice. Independents, in this case for 2016, overwhelmingly supported the Republican person. You don't have to actually not not you don't have to. There are some people that are more issue specific when it comes to their vote decisions as opposed to party ID. Uh, there are ways that you can vote. Uh, you can you can be more of a prospective voter, even a retrospective voter. Uh, prospective means you're looking forward to the future based on future performance. Retrospective, you're making considerations based on what you've already experienced. Uh, so when you're looking, if you're trying to uh, determine who you'll vote for, 
let's say based on previous experience, depending upon, you know, how coronavirus, all the social, social isolation and, and uh, stay at home orders, if you know, you didn't enjoy the experience or you felt that uh, the president did not do a good job, you may actually have a poor outlook or just feel like, you know, all this is for the birds. You may hold the president accountable for that this fall in November. However, if you look at it and say this was positive, this was the best that you could do, you can also look at this and say, you know what, the president did a really good job in trying to uh, stem the spread of the coronavirus. Or you can look at it from a perspective. You can look on base future performance. Like if this quarantine continues to happen and, you know, the fall semester doesn't even get to happen, I am going to hold somebody accountable. And that, in that case would be eventually when the election happens, you may hold the president responsible and say, I'm not going to vote for the president. Or you may say, you know what, we have to do what we have to do, or maybe it gets better. I believe that, you know, the economy, when we are able to leave our houses, we're going to spend our stimulus checks. It's going to be great. Everything's going to shoot through the roof. And then if you believe that way, then you'll vote for the president that way, too. Uh, you could also look at means and ends. You can consider spatial uh, performance on spatial issues or even valence issues. Spatial issues refer to how vo voters care about how something is done. So the ways in which you quell a situation. Perhaps you may think the best way to uh, mitigate coronavirus is to declare martial law for six months. Everybody has to stay in their house. No one can leave for any reason except for like getting your mail. If that is the way you believe things should be done to deal with the coronavirus, and that is whatever like the candidate you want for president say that that's what they're going to do, maybe you'll vote for your candidate based on their preferred method of resolving things. That's a spatial issue. If martial law is your way to do it, you'll probably support any candidate that wants to do martial law. Meanwhile, for valence issues, voters want a particular outcome. Like, I don't care. I don't care what happens. I just want to be able to leave my house. And so the way that you could just, you know, ultimately leave your house, you know, you can have a purge. You can have martial law. You could just choose to disregard rules and regulations. You just want to be able to leave your house. And if that's the case, you're just voting for whatever is the quickest means to your end. That's a valence issue. I just want a specific outcome. So let's talk about the median voter theorem. So the way that this works is imagine, actually there's a great video for it also on YouTube. You can type in median voter theorem. And so I'm going to explain this video. <laughs> uh, the way that this works. So imagine a line, imagine a street, if you will. Uh, and it's hot outside. It's a beautiful day, apparently, outside my, outside my window. I know I told y'all not to look out your windows, but look out my window. It's beautiful outside. It's probably warm. Nice time to have some ice cream or something like that. So anyways, imagine that. And you want some ice cream. And you see there are two ice cream trolleys, two ice cream salesmen outside. Uh, and of course, these individuals want to secure as much of the neighborhood's support as possible, or in particular, this one street. Uh, they can always position themselves in a line to make sure which one of them gets majority of the house, get majority of the houses on a street. Now, ultimately, the way that they would work ideally is no matter which way one would place themselves, the other could always get on the other side to try and get the rest or the remaining of that street. And ultimately, what that means is it's best that the ice cream men stay on the opposite ends of said street because as each one tries to inch closer to try and secure more of the houses, the other ice cream trucker, in this case, ultimately we're talking about politics, the other candidate can always position themselves on the other side to try and limit the amount of houses, the amount of appeal, ultimately the amount of candidates that they can appeal to. So they stay on the outsides. 
And so ultimately the goal is to appeal in such a way that they can secure the middle voter, secure the middle house, secure the middle customer. And in doing so, by securing that median voter, that middle voter, you secure the election. Appeal to the middle person, you secure everybody that's already on your side. In the middle, you secure majority of the voters. That's how you win the election. So all of that, basically the median voter theorem argues that when policy options can be lined up on a single dimension, majority rule will pick the policy most preferred by the voter whose ideal policy is to the left half of the voters and to the right half of the voters. Basically, the candidate whose position is closest to the middle vo me median voters position is likely to win. Appeal to the middle, you secure majority of the votes. And so you don't even have to vote based on party ID, on issues, or even just, you know, vote based on which one appeals to who do you perceive, if you perceive yourself to be the median voter, even perceive to that. You can even vote based on characteristics of the candidate. Uh, there is a whole line of research that talks about the uh, quote unquote superficial demographics or characteristics or even aspects of candidates that, you know, some people or most people would think are considered superficial it shouldn't even matter in an election, but believe it or not, they matter. Uh, race, ethnicity, religion, gender, geography, social background, marriage status, all of those things matter and can influence voters' decisions. Uh, voters tend to prefer, prefer candidates that look like themselves because they assume that those candidates are likely to have views closer to their own. There is like studies that show like back in 2004, the reason why John Kerry struggled uh, to get support is because there were actually uh, viewer, not viewers, voters who were polled, potential voters that said they felt like they could actually meet George Bush, son Bush in a bar and have a drink with them. They felt like John Kerry was not accessible, that they would not meet him down at the local bar or that he would even go to the local bar or even let's drink beer. These things matter. Likewise, uh, in terms of other attributes, believe it or not, attractive candidates get more votes than the facially challenged. So it doesn't matter if you have a heart full of, you know, a heart of gold and you consider yourself to be perhaps the best ruler. You can be the best candidate for the job. If you look like Quasimodo, you are not going to get as much support as the supermodel. Attractiveness matters. Voters also care about particular characteristics such as honesty and vigor. Uh, another type of characteristic could be incumbency. And this is an advantage most of the time. Voters will support the person that is currently in office. It requires less mental capacity, less mental energy to try and comprehend or even calculate the potential fit and effort the candidate the challenger could provide well if he was elected into that position as opposed to just reinstating the person that's already there. It's like, all right, that person's been there for 10 years. Give him another two. I haven't heard anything bad yet. Let him stay. So also there are times in which elections happen and nobody likes either choices. Part of me wonders if... That's what's going to happen in the Democratic election, the uh, upcoming Democratic nominee choice, nomination choice, choice for president. Yeah, you know, Uncle Joe lasted. He lasted, even though there were times it was touch and go that we thought that he wasn't going to make it. Uncle Joe was still there. And, you know, Bernie Sanders is there. But, you know, there were a lot of early uh, candidates that never made it even to the primary season. I'm talking about Kamala Harris. Ultimately, we saw Elizabeth Warren had to quit. Pete Buttigieg. I said Ohio loved Pete. 
at the beginning, uh, especially what last year, end of last year for the state's, cha uh, state's dinner and all that stuff, there are all these early people that never made it to the final two. Are we going to see instances where people have to choose between the lesser of two evils? So ultimately to recap, which of the following plays the most important role in voters' decisions? Is it the candidate's characteristics? Is it party ID? Is it the issues? Or is it the position on the ballot? It's party ID B. Party ID is the most important. Following party ID is then issues, then their exact position on the ballot. And actually not the, no, it goes party ID, then issues, then characteristics, then position. In fact, their exact placement on the ballot really doesn't matter. But just know party ID is the most important. The most important. And so what does it take to be number one? Two is not a winner and three no one remembers. All candidate, all candidates, all campaigns face similar challenges. How to bring people in, how to raise money, how to organize and coordinate activities. What message do you sell to the people? And then ultimately, how do you sell said message to the people? There is no one best way to run for office. There are multiple strategies, multiple ways of securing the top house, multiple ways of securing the White House. But regardless of the route you take, it's going to take a long time and it's going to cost you an arm and a leg, maybe two arms and a leg, one kidney and a piece of a lung. It's really, really, really expensive. In fact, one of the biggest reasons why all of those people who originally were at the what first Democratic uh, speech, the first debates are no longer there is because it costs an arm and a leg. I can't recall who was like the first person to quit, but I'm thinking like Wayne Messam, Kamala Harris, Julian Castro, Buttigieg, uh, Klobuchar, who else like just up and randomly quit. Uh, I can't even remember. I know one of them, I was like called Grandpa Mike. One, like there were so many people and oh, Tim Ryan, uh, something Stewart, all of these people at first, it seemed like half, half of uh, the House as well as half of the Democratic Senate was running for president at one point in time, right? The reason why they all quit is because it costs a lot of money. And word on the street is it's still that apparently uh, Bernie Sanders has more money than Uncle Joe does. Why? Costs a lot of money. In fact, heck, rumor has it Elizabeth Warren took out a $30 million loan to try and stay afloat through Super Tuesday, and it still didn't work. I hope she raised enough money to pay it back because, yeesh, can you imagine taking out all that money and then you still lose? The Ooh, I don't know, maybe because of the coronavirus, maybe, you know, maybe her lender has given her a reprieve for a little while. Let's hope, right? And so let's talk about these campaign organizations that cost an arm and a leg. So most organizations are temporary. They're created by the candidate to run for a particular office, and then they disband shortly after election day. Uh, particularly for presidents, uh, the way that those work is like the top levels of their campaign organizations, especially as it relates to policy in specific areas, they can transition over into the governing coalition, which is kind of cool. But for Senate, uh, House, governor, state legislative offices on down, these are temporary organizations that are created just to see a person through until, what's it called it? Through until election day. Uh, parties also have a number of permanent organizations as well as interest groups, PACs and super PACs. And we'll talk about packing and super packing when we talk about parties and interest groups next week. 
So let's talk about these tactics. Uh, campaigns today are longer than ever before, and they employ TV, radio, direct mail, internet ads, get out the vote activities, campaign events such as rallies, meet and greets, debates. There's also, all of this is so expensive. It's finally 2020. It is April 2020. I have been talking about the 2020 presidential election since I've been here. Yes, I have been talking about 2020, like who could be running, what's at stake, what will it look like, even though I've been saying since I've been here, Trump's going to win a re-election. Like I have been saying this, but I have been talking about 2020 since 2018. Apparently the 2020 presidential election season started when John Delaney, gosh, is John Delaney still running? I have to ask someone, but I've been talking about it. I've been talking about John Delaney for but John Delaney was the first person to announce his candidacy for president for 2020. And he did so back in 2018. You should look him up. He's, he, he's really earnest. I think he would be a solid vice president pick. It's just that he has the charisma of a rock. It's really bad. But... I mentioned John Delaney to say it takes a long time. And perhaps one of the reasons why we don't know much about him is because he's n he never really did raise enough money, was never really able to draw enough buzz, to create enough buzz about himself to actually increase in the ratings and to get invited to the illustrious cool, cool kids table, come out to the cool debates, participate in the cool round tables, etc. So are businesses and corporations allowed to spend money on political campaigns? Yes. Yes, they're not even going to let you give you time to think about it. Yes, they can, and they have, and they will continue to do so. Spend all the money. Koch Brothers, Soros, all of these people, Walmart, the Walton family, all of that. Hobby Lobby people, all of that. Chick-fil-A, all of that. Yes, all the money. The incumbent advantage is significant in congressional campaigns. In fact, over 90% of Congress members running for re-election win re-election. So why do incumbents, why, what exactly is this incumbent advantage? It's the advantage people who are already running, who are already hold the office have in their re-election. Why, why does it exist? It's because the incumbent already has greater name recognition. You, you can tell who is who on a ballot. If one person, let's, we can use John Lewis, for example. He is the House representative from one of the districts out of Atlanta in Congress. Representative John Lewis versus Joe Blow or whoever the challenger is. John Lew you, can, you can figure out who John Lewis is versus Dr. Breonna Mack. Uh, they also have greater fundraising activities and advantages. George Soros will cut a check for the person that's already in office as opposed to the challenger. Uh, you're far more likely, even if you were a businessman or even if you had millions to spend, you are far more likely to give the money to the person that's already in office then the plucky challenger, especially if that's a person you have never heard of before, just came up to you today, said, hey, I'm running for this office. Will you support me? You're going to support the person that's already in office or be far more willing to write a check, a large check for the person that's already there because they're far more likely to win. And then, of course, the incumbent is far more likely to be trustworthy and receive that money because they already have a demonstrated record. They have casework, of course, when you recall from casework, they start helping uh, veterans achieve or access their benefits uh, for high school seniors who want to go to any of the military academies, anything of that sort. Uh, if you're dealing, uh, you have a constituent that needs help uh, uh, accessing some aspect related to the state house or something related to diplomacy, et cetera. All of these various projects that you've done uh, done or tasks you've done for constituents in your district makes you look good. It also helps when it's time for re-election.
And of course, the challenger does not have these things that you do. And this is just a perk of already being in the office. So let's talk about the 2016 election. It was a dark time. It wasn't dark. I worked as a pollster for, uh, gosh, what was it? Amanda? It's a village south of Columbus. It's on the way to uh, Logan, Ohio. So like if you're Logan and Athens, Ohio, it's on, was it US 33? It's a little village. Literally, it's a village called Amanda. Uh, I worked as a poster there. Wild. It's like there's cow manure. It's a farming community. It's really cute. Uh, but anyways, uh, I worked as a pollster and like saw in real time individuals. There were a lot of people who actually voted for Jill Stein, Gary, gosh, I can't even remember his name, Gary Johnson and Trump. I think for every, tr every three Trumps, there was one Jill, for every three votes for Trump, there was one Owen, uh, Gary Johnson, one Jill Stein, and then I think, uh, very rare that you got, got a Hillary Clinton. Very rare, but you got way more Jill Steins and Gary Johnsons, and then of course, overwhelmingly Donald Trumps. Uh, more than, but anyways, in terms of turnout, more than 136 million Americans voted for the president, members of Congress, governors, and other numerous officials. Uh, Trump was elected president, and Republicans, for the first time in a long time, secured both the House and the Senate. Of course, this is the Electoral College map back in 2016, bleeding red everywhere. Uh, Trump received 306 of the college uh, Electoral College votes. Uh, Clinton and Kane, what is Tim Kane doing with his life? We have not heard hide nor hair from him since 2016. Why is that? We've heard from John, you know, we've we, we we know what Sarah Palin's doing. We 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 know what we know what Paul Ryan was doing. Hell, we know what, why haven't we heard from Tim Kaine? Is he still alive? Like, what's his deal? Anyways, two thirty two. What is the minimum magic number of electoral college votes a presidential candidate needs to win? Two hundred seventy. You need at minimum two hundred seventy votes electoral college votes to win. Trump received three hundred six. Uh, if you want to know what happens if neither candidate is able to receive or secure 270 votes, take voters in elections. We'll talk about all of those doomsday uh, type options that could happen if neither candidate is able to win. 270 votes. So unity and division in the parties back in 16, uh, growing polarization within the parties, increased ideological splits. Uh, and the reasoning for that is because neither party is uniform. Uh, let's see. Prior to that, 2010, 2012, there was the rise of the Tea Party. Uh, but luckily, the Republican Party was actually able to co-op and absorb Tea Party ideology into uh, the party. Uh, some of the big ideologues from the Tea Party that are still there, Ted Cruz, he was an original Tea Partier. There was Ted Cruz. Who are others? Ted Cruz? Uh, no, maybe Marco Rubio. I think Marco Rubio was also a Tea Partier. Uh, Tim Scott, he's not much of an ideologue, but that is also a Tea Partier who was elected into Congress and now has been absorbed within the Republican mainframe. Uh, with how and so the Republicans were able to absorb that idea, that ideology, that minority party, if you will. Uh, meanwhile, within the Democratic Party, instead of absorbing the Democratic Socialists, so the Bernie team, the Bernie Bros, if you will. Oh no, all hell has broken out and they're still bickering back and forth to this day. Uh, yeah. And then also what was going on in 2016, it was like Trump versus everybody else. There was even one point in time they were like debating each other over like sizes of hands. I have a nice clip. I show it to voters in elections. Like at one point in time, they were, they, Rubio, uh, Cruz, and Donald Trump were arguing and debating about the size of their hands, who had manly, lovely hands. It was wild. But moving onward, 
let's talk about house results. So in terms of turnout, uh, actually the highest turnout we've, we've seen in election results was back in 08. 61% of eligible voters turned out to vote. We saw the Democratic Party take over Congress. Uh, in terms of the number of re-elections, 98% of Democrats were elected as well as 92% of Republicans. Even down to uh, 2016, even though we saw a turnout decrease between 08 and 16, uh, between 61% and 58%, what we saw instead, what we still saw was overwhelming majority of Democrats went that were up for re-election be re-elected, as well as 95% of Republicans. This is the incumbency advantage in action for both Democrats and Republicans overwhelming majorities of the incumbents being re-elected. Same thing for the Senate. Overwhelming majority. They're up for re-election, they will secure it. You can see for both 2012 and 16, all Democratic incumbents were re-elected. All of them. You can even say the same thing for 10 and 14 for Dem for Republicans. 100% of the Republicans that were running for re-election in the Senate secured re-election. That is wild. You can see it happen. It happened for Republicans three times in 04, 10, and 14. Same things for Democrats in 06, 08, 12, and 16. This is the incumbency advantage really, really hard. It's really problematic. Yeah. I believe this is our last slide for the section. When you want to talk about voter shifts, difference changes in vote between 2012 and 2016, while we wait for that to go away, So in terms of the percentage of people who voted for Obama in 12, Clinton in 16, or voted Romney in 12, and Trump in 16, so uh, 12 is blue, 16 is orange. You can see that majority of men, you know, more so voted for, uh, voted Republican as opposed to, uh, what's it called, more of a split. But we see more so, slightly more men in 2016. Uh, for females, uh, slightly more in 2012, voted Democratic. Uh, let's see, for people of age, so we see still that in terms of age, the younger you are, the more likely you are to vote Democratic, especially in 12 as opposed to 2016. Uh, let's see, majorities of, what's it calls it, also older. You'll see the uh, right-leaning increase as age comes up. That's because as the older you are, the more likely you are to be slightly more conservative as you age. It's, they say it's because we grow up, we get married, we get families, we buy houses, property, we have jobs that makes us change our ideals. That's what they say. Uh, you can see in terms of vote share by racial and la uh, ethnic identity, uh, you see that majority overwhelming Black people support the Democratic Party. Uh, you also see... Uh, not as large majorities, but still majorities within uh, the Latino population as, a, as well as with the Asian American population. You see 71 and 65 percent. So 71 in 12, 65 in 16, uh, 73 in 12, and 65 percent in 16 Asian. Uh, in terms of income, you see that overwhelmingly, especially in uh, uh, 12, 60% of people that made less than uh, $50,000 supported Democrats, while it's 38%, you know, supported Republicans. But you see more of a split uh, between those who make 50 and 100,000, uh, that split between Republicans and Democrats in both 08 and 12. And then what we see for those that make real money, the real buku bucks, uh, those in 2012, 54% support the Republican Party in 12, and then 48% uh, in 16 uh, voted for, you know, Republicans. Yeah, 
So we see a little bit of an increase in 16, but it's still split at best. And so I believe that is the end of the election slides. Hooray. <laughs> so that way, when we pick back up on Monday and we have our in interactions and discussions about parties and videos, videos galore, we can talk about all this stuff. So enjoy your weekend. If you have any questions, send me email, Carabo, schedule a time to talk before Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs>